Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Let's Talk ETC. I have Pi Scale or Anthony Lasardi with me today. And as always, he's going to give us a, a much appreciated update about the latest uh, goings on in Ethereum Classic. So, as always, welcome, Anthony. Hey, Christian. Thanks for having me. Yeah, sure. Yaz yeah. is here too. Oh, okay. All right. Hi, Yaz. So I hope you guys all had a good holidays and got well rested. Christmas, New Year. Yeah. Yeah. Had a fun. solid two or three days off, I think. Yeah. Wait, that's it? That's not much. Three days off, you said? Yeah, I think so. I think that's how many I had off. Okay, so you're hardworking. So. All right, so um, oh, you know what? Before we start, so Anthony, we all know, or they should know that you work for ETC Cooperative. Yes, can you just real quickly uh, tell the listeners your background and your affiliation with ETC? Yeah, so I'm part of the ETC Cooperative. I manage mostly the developer relations, which is um, facilitating ease of use adoption of ETC for other developers by creating different project um, uh, projects for them to utilize ETC. At the same time, I do a lot of other technical work for ETC, a lot of project data analysis and stuff for the network. My background is software and robotics. Okay, great. Now, so I know I knew that. I mean, I've had you before, but it's always good just in case somebody didn't watch the, the previous show when you were on. So, yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah. So, all right. So, uh, Anthony, what do you have for us this time? What What's the latest in ETC land? Uh, yeah. So, the first and foremost thing that's on everybody's mind is that ETC had uh, several substantial and very likely intentional reorgs. Uh, what a reorg is, is it essentially lets you double spend money so you can spend it once somewhere and then take it back and give it back to yourself. Uh, that happens whenever a miner gets a substantial amount of the network hash rate, typically over 51% of it. And essentially what happened there was about a hundred blocks or so uh, were, were forked off. Uh, about, I think, eight or nine total times. And there were two exchanges that reported double spends. They haven't actually given us any good information on which transactions were, you know, which ones were uh, removed from the chain as a result of the double spend. But it really underlied, it really highlighted a underlying security issue, which is that the majority of people, when they receive cryptocurrency transactions, they don't wait enough confirmations. Um, 100 ETC confirmations is not much proof of work. And honestly, they should just be waiting more in order to make sure that this doesn't happen to them. Right, right. So this was, I, I, this was mentioned on a previous show. Yeah, so uh, these 51% attacks uh, basically just slow... Uh, activity down, but it doesn't. It, right, the, the the ETC can still function uh, even if there was other attacks. As long as people uh, wait enough confirmations, yeah, you wait enough confirmations. Every fifty one percent attack is a temporal thing. Blockchains eventually settle, and the longer you let the blockchain settle on a particular transaction, the the better uh, probabilistic fi finality you get. And really, people aren't properly calculating these things. So, for example, they wait two Bitcoin confirmations, and that is a substantial amount of resources to undo. But on ETC or Litecoin or even Ethereum, they wait uh, what's numerically a larger number of confirmations. But in terms of total amount of computational effort to create those blocks, it's actually much less. So exchanges need to wait more and they need to wait more uh, relevant to the amount of uh, the total value of the transactions that they're doing really to get much better security, much better probabilistic finality. 
All right. Oh, you just, I hadn't thought of that, but that's a, that's a, a perceptive point. So the difficulty of ETC mining ETC is less. And so uh, it takes more confirmations, but a few Bitcoin confirmations it is more substantial. I hadn't thought of that, but yeah, I guess that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I'll also, in a lot of cases, two right. Bitcoin confirmations is not enough. I right. mean, if you're sending a little bit of Bitcoin, if you're sending anything, you know, less than 25-ish Bitcoin, then yeah, that's probably enough. But for larger transactions, it's not enough. And people need to know that they need to wait more. Right. Uh, and then just one point of clarification, if I could make it. So um, I think to do a 51% attack, it, it, it's, it, it's probably more accurately called a 101% attack. Because if you imagine that I had... 51% of the ability of all the other miners put together, I still can't out mine them. So to, to quote unquote out mine them, I really need to duplicate all the other honest miners. And when I do that, then because the capacity doubled, it, it's called a 51% attack, but it's really maybe better called a 101% attack. Just a minor point of clarification. Yes, yeah, sort of. I mean, you can still out mine with fifty one with exactly fifty one percent of the hash rate. It just takes longer. Are you sure? I mean, because the other the other miners still have twice as much power as I do, so they would win probabilistically wise in all the competitions. See what I'm saying? I don't think so. Um, right? They have, tw if they have twice, twice as much. If they have twice the terms, you need more hash rate. Having exactly fifty-one percent uh, kind of makes it it makes it take a long time. Right. So just so, something to think about. But let, let's let's move on. But then, yeah, yeah. Uh huh. All right. So so that happened, and it's not really a reflection of anything wrong with the technology, the infrastructure of ETC. The reason that this is happening is just because we need to increase the total mining capacity. Yeah, exactly. Which is kind of frustrating. Um, anyway, so. Yeah, it's that people aren't properly modeling their risk, um, which is to be expected. Nobody ever does. Uh, <laughs> right. So, all right. So what else is what else do you have for us? Yeah, so I actually just saw an article from ETC Labs a little less than an hour ago. They are working on quite a lot of different things to bring to ETC to, uh, you know, make the EVM faster, get LLVM support, which should hopefully make uh, it so you can write programs in other languages. They are working on a just-in-time compiler. Like, there was a lot of stuff in that article, and I haven't had time to properly and fully digest it. But it looks really cool. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, as you wanted to say something? Oh uh, yeah, um, they're also going to be supporting multi-gap more moving forward, which is um, which built by a previous developer for ETC Dev called um, Wei Tang, I believe, mm -hmm. and it's like much faster implementation than classic gap. Um, okay, so that'll be really exciting for the you know like having multi-gap supported more is much faster. Um, that'll be really exciting for running gap. So 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 basically, that it's a faster client. If I understood you correctly, yeah. Because if I remember correctly, what Wei Tang did, he forked it off um, the where, like the Ethereum gap, and he added support for connecting to the ETC network from there. Okay. Um, but the other difference is it does not have Sputnik on it, so it might be ported to Sputnik might be ported to Multigas later on. Okay. Yeah. All right, cool. Um, Anthony, uh, do you know anything about the LLVM support that you mentioned? Is that like an alternative virtual machine, or what exactly does that mean? Uh, it's not an alternative virtual machine. So LLVM is kind of an intermediary language. Uh, if you, for example, specify the EVM in LLVM, then any programming language that targets LLVM can compile to EVM. So it's kind of, uh, it's not exactly, but to oversimplify it, it's kind of a translation layer. So if, for example, uh, my C program has an LLVM, my C compiler has an LLVM backend, 
then I can compile directly from C into EVM code and run it on the ETC blockchain. And uh, okay, I, I see. Same thing uh, if you know Rust or Go with the, or uh, Go or some other language does the same thing. Um, yeah, that's a way oversimplification, but it just basically lets more languages uh, compile down to and run on ETC's blockchain and other EVM based blockchains. Yeah, I'd be I'm really interested to see how that plays out because that would allow people to use their favorite language, whatever it is that they're most comfortable with, instead of learning some new, you know, language that they may well they likely never have heard of if they're not in blockchain for a long time, like Solidity, right, or, or Viper, if they could use their favorite language, that would be uh, very nice. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, very cool. Anything else? Uh, let's see. What else? What are you working on, guys? Um, I'm working on a new project that I can't really announce who we're working with yet, but basically we want to put the whole entire ETC data blockchain data as a data set that you can work with with Python online so people can eventually just use SQL query to query the ETC and get and maybe do a lot of data analysis on it, plot some charts and stuff. So it would make it really easy to run ETC at the database. Okay, so it's a, you're going to expose an interface so that people could access the information easier somehow, yeah. and it's with Python? Um, it's like an SQL, but then you can use Python on top of it. Like, you know, if you want to create, you know, do a lot of data analysis with it on a notebook, like a Jupyter notebook with it. But okay. it essentially, it will just be like an SQL database that updates daily. And um, people can, yeah, you can run queries on it. You can, like, determine a lot of interesting relationships in ETC. There's a lot of things that I want to, like, use it for. At the same time, we'll be open for the rest of the world. So anyone can run it a lot. I can't even imagine what people would find with it, what kind of data. But it will be really interesting to see what people come up with. Right. That reminds me of a previous show where I had somebody that was using uh, machine learning to analyze blockchain data. And they, one of their use cases was to find, um, you know, various malicious activities, malicious transactions, like on the Bitcoin blockchain. So uh, that I could see somebody maybe using machine learning to crunch all of that ETC blockchain data. For, for, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that would be really interesting. Even like an anomaly detection or anything like that, that would be really cool with machine learning. Right, right, right. Uh, other than that, um, I wrote an article that was published uh, last week um, about running your ETC on a Raspberry Pi. Oh, I saw that. Okay, yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, if anyone hadn't checked it out, it's on the Ethereum Classic Medium. Um, but basically, like, it's going to be several parts to that guide. The first part is basically how do you, um, like, wh what what tools do you need? Which is, like, I made it very minimal. You just need, like, a Raspberry Pi and an Ethernet cable and, like, a USB and a micro SD card. And basically with that, I teach people how to, um, how do you compile parity on Docker? How do you move it to your Raspberry Pi, how do you configure your Raspberry Pi, and then how do you sync your parity Ethereum Classic network on your Raspberry Pi. Um, future guide would include like what I want to explore, maybe building a whole circuit connected to your Raspberry Pi, so you can do a lot of cool stuff with your ETC network. Like maybe, um, I don't know, like in terms of IoT, maybe like simple application, like turning LED lights on and off or something more interesting, at least in my case, like watering my plants when I'm remote. <laughs> <laughs> right. So kind of, some kind of Internet of Things applications. Yeah, basically. Yeah. And yeah. I just want to yeah, make it really simple that anyone can build on top of it after that. Yeah. When, when I first saw the title, I thought, how is it going to run a full client? and have the entire blockchain on a Raspberry Pi, but you just answered it, right? With the micro SD card, you can get as big a one as the big, whatever capacity you want. Yeah. So, uh, that's good. Is it light client? 
Oh, it's a light client, but could you? Yeah, because like it's like it would require a lot more. Like, I mean, you can technically do a parity like full client, and you just need like a larger SD card. But I just did it just because like just to keep it light for IoT stuff. Okay. I need a light client, but there's no reason why you shouldn't run like a regular client on Raspberry Pi specifically for parity. Okay. Yeah, I like parity. I, I use parity all the time. Yes, highly yeah. recommend it. It's so lightweight, so great. I love yeah. it. <laughs> yep. So very cool. So a lot of innovation happening. Yeah. How did you come up with that idea? I'm curious. Uh, what made you think about putting it on a Raspberry Pi? Um, so my background had been robotics. So I, I lo- like I used to like work exclusively like software design for hardware and at, at the same time electronic uh, circuit design. So I wanted an excuse just to get back into hardware and. Uh try to do like the perfect marriage between hardware and like the blockchain. So I thought like starting off with a Raspberry Pi and teaching uh, potential developers and users how to set up their own IoT device with ETC might have been a fun project. Yes, yes, very cool. So you should start your own Internet of Things blockchain company, right? That's those are the two big buzzwords, one of the two, some of the two big buzzwords, buzz, big buzzwords floating around, right? Internet of Things and blockchain technology. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> that's the million dollar idea. We need we need Yaz at the ETC Cooperative for right now, so <laughs> <some> <laughs> ideas there. Don't, don't fill his head with too much ideas, okay? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. and back to your point uh, for the 51% versus 101%, you're actually, I think you're right in a, in a way, because you could do 51% attacks if you have 51% of the current on network live hash rate and you just take it off and go do your secret mining uh, in order to come back and then have beat out the rest of the network. But you're right that relative to the rest of the network, you actually do have 101% of the hash rate, uh, which is an interesting way to look at it. Oh, I, no, I see what you're saying. Yes, it, 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 somebody that was bringing new mining capacity, they, they would need 101%, but somebody that was taking existing capacity would only need 51%. Yes, I, yeah, that, I, I see why there was a, a difference there, difference. In yeah. the, um, actually, they, you just brought another idea. If somebody did do that, if that would mean that the difficulty would drop quickly, right? If somebody was planning to do your type of 51% attack. So I would imagine with, we were just talking about machine learning, you could probably somehow detect that type of situation. But anyway. Well, yeah. I mean, if you're monitoring the live network, you could see that hash rate is just cut in half and or worse. And you could, uh, yeah, block times, You well, you do it indirectly. Block times go up, difficulty goes down. And, right. And yeah. Yeah, you don't know if you need machine learning. You just kind of need uh, some monitoring. Just, I, yeah, just an if-then if statement. Right. If the difficulty gets cut in half, better be extra careful. Wait a little more, a few more confirmations. Yeah. 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 And that's actually something, too, uh, in that article that ETC Labs Core published. They're working on some more advanced monitoring tools. And there are some from ETC Dev that were running, but then when ETC Dev ran out of business, uh, nobody was running them. So we're starting those back up, too. Okay, good. Yeah, I'm actually going to have some of the startups that ETC Labs are supporting on the show in the next, uh, you know, few uh, upcoming shows. And so I'm looking forward to a lot of the good stuff that ETC Labs seems to be working on. You know, they, they'll probably be very uh, generous, big contributors, you know, this year. Yeah. So... All right. Very good. Good stuff. So um, what else do you have for us? Mm, oh, Mastering Ethereum finally came out. Uh, I forget if it had actually come out the last show or if I just got mine delivered recently. But yeah, it's out. It's a great read. There's a lot of mentions of ETC in there, a lot of great technical resources, and just a lot of great information on Ethereum, the blockchain, and how it works. And I think, don't we have you to thank for a big part of the reason that Ethereum Classic is mentioned so much in Mastering Ethereum? Yeah, sure. 
<laughs> Neither confirm nor deny. Yeah, no, I, I made a good deal of contributions to it uh, in the name of ETC and, and freedom and okay. Bitcoin in America. <laughs> all right, very cool. So, um, all right, so um, have we covered everything? Uh, yeah, I think so. All right, so um, as always, thank you. And can we look forward to in the new year having the your continued great ETC news updates, Anthony? Yep. And then you, okay, and Yaz, if you want to join us uh, anytime, you're welcome. Uh, love, yeah, we'd love to hear more about your Internet of Things projects. Yeah, for sure. So, all right. So, uh, welcome to the new year, guys, and uh, we'll talk to you soon. All right. Thanks, Christian. All right. Thanks.